Um, okay, so here's what you need to know about me. I just want to have fun. <laughs> I want to be happy. Uh, if I had a spirit animal, so to speak, it would be an otter. <laughs> like, it seems to me they're always either playing or they're blissfully floating along on the water, don't have a care in the world, and you look at them and they got this smile that's permanently on their cute little face. And I'm, that's what I want. And in fact, I've had more than my share of otter moments and seasons when gratitude comes naturally and easily. But what about those seasons of life when otter moments are hard to come by, practically non-existent? I've come to understand that the very things that make it difficult to be grateful are the same things that can deepen my gratitude, bringing it to a new level, if I let the spirit do his work. So a little background. In 1985, 10 years into a difficult marriage, my 30-year-old agnostic son, Tom, or husband, Tom, was sitting in a chair in our living room. Suddenly, our two-year-old son jumped into his lap and hugged him, saying, I love you, Daddy. Tom immediately sensed that he had a father in heaven who was waiting to hear those words from him. In that moment, Tom miraculously became a believer, and I returned to the faith of my youth. The changes that took place in my husband were dramatic, and our marriage improved greatly. We took our faith seriously, joining a conservative church and homeschooling our kids. In 1994, I delivered my last baby, giving us five children from infant to 11 years old, and I loved my life. I knew I was blessed. Then, uh, around the year 2000, Tom was beginning to return to his old ways. He had gone back to smoking, was going to church less, and began to withdraw from us, often spending entire weekends doing online gaming. He was increasingly becoming a distant, sometimes angry father, a completely different dad to my last two children than he was for the first three. I felt like everything the Lord had given me when my husband came to faith was being taken away. He gradually stopped attending church altogether, and when he wasn't working, spent most of his time locked away in the bedroom. I think the responsibilities of raising children and the stress of trying to be a good Christian was becoming too much for him and he was sinking into chronic depression. Over the ensuing years, Tom was ill-equipped to handle all the challenges that came when our children started thinking and acting independently, sometimes making choices we didn't agree with. My husband took this all very personally and believed God had let us down when we had been serving him faithfully. I was confused too, and I was trying to process all of this. Honestly, my heart was crushed, and I cried myself to sleep more often than not. I had never considered for a moment that my husband would revert to his pre-conversion self, still a believer, but not walking the walk. As for my children, I was devastated upon learning out of the blue that my middle child, Liz, had become addicted to heroin. I received a call that she had been arrested the same morning I was headed to the hospital where Tom was awaiting a quadruple by bypass after having a heart attack. Several months later, Liz nearly died of an overdose. Over the next 13 years, there would be a pattern of rehab, staying drug-free for long stretches, and then relapsing. I gave birth to a son who as an adult began to take hormones and transition to a female, including a legal name change. I gave birth to a daughter who now identifies as non-binary using the pronouns they, them, and their. This all uh, took some use getting used to. Anxiety, depression, serious mental health issues, suicidal thoughts, loss of faith, these are all issues I never envisioned for my children as I had those babies in my arms and dreamed of their futures. But don't get me wrong, 
I adore all my children, and we're close. They're lovely people, and I love to spend time with them. I have two amazing grandchildren and another on the way, two wonderful daughters-in-law. But seeing our kids struggle always affects us to the core of our being. Like many of you, over the years, I cared for my parents as they declined, and my in-laws as well. My mother's long chronic illness was extremely traumatic for myself and my siblings. I'm sure a good many of you can relate to a lot of this. Then last September, my daughter Liz had a relapse and died from an accidental fentanyl overdose. Four months later, after several years of physical illness and declining mental health, my husband passed away from cardiac arrest. So uh, this is not sounding like an otter's life, right? In fact, portions of my life have been glaringly opposite. Yet, it is a life that has fostered deep gratitude. As I questioned God and what was happening over the years, he brought me to certain realizations, to a theology of suffering. This is where I want to land in this talk. Through my own experiences, the wisdom I've received from others, and through the deep work of the Spirit in me, I'm learning to be grateful even in suffering. I can, constantly, or I can confidently say, most of the time, God is good. He's good despite the suffering I see all around me. He's good even when suffering comes to me. The question becomes not, why me, but why not me? He's good even when my prayers are not answered in the way I want them to be. I believe that walking this earth is a privilege. I have the opportunity to be transformed and shaped into the image of Jesus. Although this earth looks different than God's original good design, he is redeeming it daily through his people. I'm sure most of you have experienced the growth that only comes from hardship. And this is important. The time I am on this earth is the only time throughout eternity that I will experience suffering. Let that sink in for a moment. I want nothing to be wasted. There's meaning and purpose in my suffering. God would not have placed me on this earth if that were not the case. When I look at the scriptures, I see that I can be grateful that suffering will not overcome. Paul tells us in Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I'm grateful that suffering develops maturity. James 1, 2 to 4 says, consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And Paul tells us that we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. I see that my suffering develops compassion for others. Second Corinthians, Paul tells us, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. I have opportunities to help and be helped by others. Galatians 6, 2. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. My ultimate comfort is knowing that God loves me with an everlasting love, and Jesus will never leave me nor forsake me. During the time my husband was withdrawing from us, the Holy Spirit lovingly and powerfully revealed to me that I was developing bitterness in my heart. I needed to take my thoughts captive and develop a heart of gratitude. 
I needed to flip the script of complaining that was playing in my head and replace it with scripture and the recognition of all that I was grateful for. I literally would stop myself mid-complaint and say, no, I am blessed. And I'd mentally go through the things I was grateful for. I asked the Holy Spirit to help me. And I was amazed at how quickly this became a habit. My go-to became gratitude instead of complaint. The degree to which this has impacted my response to suffering is nothing short of miraculous in my life. Practicing gratitude allowed me to live in peace and joy, providing an atmosphere in my home that was fun and loving, a happy place for my children to grow up in. When my Lizzie died, of course I was shocked. It was traumatic and sudden. I was expecting to spend the afternoon with her that day and instead was on my way to Port Huron to join her boyfriend who had broken into her apartment and found her. Yet, I had an overriding sense of God's goodness and love, that he was in control, that Lizzie was safe with him and no longer suffering, and that all things would indeed work together for good. I was grateful that she loved Jesus, and I'd had almost 33 years with her, over 33 years with her, and I spontaneous smiled, <clears throat> spontaneously smiled and felt joy when I thought of her. I can't explain any of this, except that I had a deep-seated conviction that though suffering would come, the Lord and his people would be with me. I guess the best way to say it is that I do not grieve without hope, and for that, I am beyond grateful. Thank you.